a lot of the time you write you write what you read what comes out is based on the diet you've been feeding yourself and which is why you find that often people kind of stay with their genres so if you're doing speculative fiction if that's your thing you'll often find that you're consuming a lot of speculative fiction um, if you're writing more literary fiction you're reading almost strictly literary fiction and if your thing of course is more commercial fiction then you're reading all the the great um, commercial fiction authors that are out there um, and I think without advocating for people to kind of narrow down their choice of of the choice of books that they read at a certain point as a writer I think you have a pretty clear idea of the kind of stuff that you want to write and at that point you will find that you gravitate towards certain types of books um, so for me if you want to write a specific thing or within a specific genre, then you've got to look for everything you can to become a master of it. There are things you'll find in my book. I have that character called Teacher in my novel, for instance. And that character is modeled after, um, there's a character called, I don't even know if it's Circe or Kirky. Nobody's been able to tell me, but it's C-I-R-C-E. Um, and it's a character in Toni Morrison's A Song of Solomon. So it's this kind of character who's larger than life, but you're often not sure if he really exists because his story is so weird. You know, his own background story. Nevertheless, he managed to kind of manages to proffer um, wisdom and advice, which is key and, and, and important. So when you read those masters, when you read the people who have really excelled within their genres, you find that you pick up certain things. You know, you'll see something and you'll be like, ah, I want to do that thing, I like it, but I'm gonna do mine differently. But, you know, you've, you've taken that idea or that idea when it dropped onto your lap, it suddenly opened up, you know, opened you up to other ideas. And which is what a writer is constant a, a writer should constantly be looking for as they're reading. There are lots of things that keep <laughs> struggling writers going. Um, I think a lot of of writers are driven by the notion of becoming famous because they see a few. Um, authors who have done very well and they believe that they could be the next one um, without fully considering that they might not quite have that level of talent um, and without understanding that sadly your success as a writer also has a lot to do with luck has a lot to do with being in the right place at the right time. Um, and that's very serious. It also has to do, unfortunately, when, when we're talking about the West, it also has to do with how the West perceives you, how useful you are to them. And this is a, um, um, when you're looking at the Western media, they, they, they engage in, in quite a bit of tokenism, which means they will select one or two or three people that they're constantly kind of engaging. Um, but there's a reason why they're engaging them. There's, they're serving a very specific and often very important purpose. And they, are, they have, you know, sensible things to say. 
So when they ask them difficult questions, they're able to come up with something that's intelligent. And they can basically bank on that. And I think that's important for, for media outlets. Um, but, but you've got to really have a, a realistic understanding of what your chances are of being a hugely successful writer that a lot of people think make a lot of money, go to a lot of different countries, meet a lot of crazy important people, things like that. But look, what you have to do is think about the fact that how many of those authors can you count on your fingers compared to the population of this country? And then compared to the population of this continent. And maybe that will put things in perspective for you. Being about in, in the right place and writing the right story at the right time is really important. And it's unfortunate that sadly, it's not all down to your hard work and your talent. It just isn't. A lot of it is about luck. The truth is that if you're a writer, it's not really your job to promote your work. That should be done by your publishing house. Um, and every publishing house that's worth its salt will have a communications, publicity, officer, individual, department. And their job is to organize perhaps a reading tour, the different events that you're going to um, do. And um, your job as a writer is then perhaps to be open and to be willing to do some of these interviews, to go on radio, on TV, um, and understand that it'll take up some of your time. You will have to maybe set a bit of time aside um, to do all those kind of communication-ish um, sort of events and publicity. Um, it's difficult for a publisher when the writer is not willing to get on the radio, talk, be fun, be nice, you know, because sometimes you're not even just feeling that way. Um, sometimes you're not even in the mood for putting, for talking about your book that you've spoken about 500 times already. You know, and that's the reality. But the little bit that you can do towards the success of this book, towards promoting this book, is having a can-do attitude. So when people call you up, oh, can we interview you to be available, to be enthusiastic, and to have a few smart things to say as well. I think that always helps. Um, so you kind of... If, if, if you've been invited to talk about a particular topic, try to read a little bit around it. Um, so for me, I wrote Baba Segi. People often want to talk to me when the subject of polygamy comes up. You know, multiple wives, um, Nigeria, politics to do with Nigeria. They will often, for a while, you know, I was one of the go-to people. So that's bound to happen. And you should just be ready and prepared for that. Um, also, there's nothing worse than an author that doesn't give anything. I think that's very difficult, both for the publisher, for the interviewer, and ultimately for the writer as well. Um, the, a very good piece of advice that I give to a lot of our authors is... I always invite them to our K Festival, for instance, and I encourage them to attend as many literary festivals as possible, to watch other writers engage, how they respond to questions and how they answer questions. This is also very important. It's an important part of the training. Well, what we ask for is, um, and I think a lot of publishers ask for the same, is a synopsis of the story, no more than one or two pages. The first 50 pages or the first three chapters, 
whichever is more, and a little bit about yourself. Um, if, and that's always helpful, just to have a little bit of insight into the person who's written the story. So for instance, um, if I get a manuscript about the Civil War, for instance, um, and I've got the synopsis and the story sounds interesting, and then I find out that the author's father fought in the Civil War. That will give me a lot of faith in that author being able to finish the story because I'll make all the connections. Okay, obviously the father's been talking to the son or the daughter, so she probably has, or he or she probably has a whole reservoir kind of full of stories that they can draw from when they are getting down to write. So do you see what I mean? That's what I mean when I say that synopsis and then being able to say a little bit about yourself does help because it's all, it's about here. You are not there to defend yourself and to talk about yourself, but you make sure you have presented the publisher with enough information to give them faith in your own abilities and of course in your talent, which is why the manuscripts that you send, send out must be in tip-top form.